And I was feeling poisoned, but I couldn't understand why. I had no idea why I was feeling poisoned. Karen, how did you find Carnivore? Well, um, that's an interesting question. I love that question. <laughs> I, uh, it was sort of last year, really. Um, I start, I, I think around the start of the summer last year, I had, hadn't been feeling that well. Well, pretty much from weirdly New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve, I started to have some really strange symptoms. I remember sitting downstairs with my family, seeing the new year in and feeling a bit dizzy and a few heart palpitations and just feeling a little bit odd. And going back, I've sort of had weird things going on for years. Nothing has ever, you know, touched with. They've never come to anything. They've just been weird things where I've just never felt quite well. And I'd just started, um, prior to Christmas, a, a course in kinesiology. I don't know if you know kinesiology, which is the muscle testing um, method. And uh, I had done it because I'm also trained as a homeopath many years ago when I was in my 40s. So, yeah, a long time ago. And um, from that point of of training as a homeopath the reason I'd gone into homeopathy was because my youngest child had had a really bad reaction to um, a vaccine and had become completely covered head to toe in eczema literally days days after the vaccine and uh, I went back to see the GP and they well my my GP himself who I knew actually personally I, I knew his kids and everything he didn't want to see me I, I had to see someone else and they made me sit in the back room because they thought that she might be infectious with measles or whatever. And I was treated like, I really weirdly, it was my first real experience of, because I was a mum with you know, youngest, well, but then she was my youngest of, I've got five kids, so she was my youngest um, by about seven years to the others. So the others had all, you know, I'd had various things with vaccinations and I was wary of, about stuff. And, you know, I'd kind of looked into it a little bit, but I hadn't looked into it fully. And so her reaction and their response, which was to admit that it was the vaccine that had overloaded her immune system, shocked me <laughs> into researching. And, and I'd had the number of a homeopath pinned on my fridge for months and months, and I decided to contact the homeopath. And she treated my daughter and I watched, she'd had this, um, this wart virus that children get, they call it um, the, the restless pox. It's an infection of, of all virus that kids get from each other, it's spread through contact. And there's nothing they can do to treat it. And she was covered in this. And I watched this go in reverse with the homeopathic treatments. I watched it disappear from her body over a period of days. And they told me it would take at least 18 months to clear up. So that opened my eyes to a whole new world and then they treated her eczema and although it never fully cleared it, it helped it a lot we went through some really tough times with the eczema and then she was treated homeopathically and she never had another vaccine after that and that that sort of started me on my path but um anyway so i decided to do this this kinesiology course just because i was curious because when i was in my 20s back in the 1980s i'd gone to a kinesiologist randomly i still don't know to this day how it came up in my universe how i found out about this person because apparently the 80s was very new for um kinesiology in this country it was in america but it had only just come into this country so i don't know how i discovered this but during that treatment i was told that i was intolerant to wheat and wine and curry powder, the three things I loved. <laughs> so I stopped eating wheat back in the 80s, which was really tough back then because there was no alternatives. It was really difficult. All my favorite foods were bread and pasta and you know stuff. So so that so that opened my eyes to how food can affect you because I saw the big difference in myself. And then obviously I did the same for my children. And they, it seemed, were allergic to certain or intolerant of certain foods, which I saw miraculously cure them of things like runny noses and things. Um, so 
so I kind of had already opened my eyes to that, but the the real clincher was was the the vaccine for for it was the MMR vaccine, which I actually didn't want her to have because she'd already had measles. So my doctor said, I said, you know, you can't give it to her as a separate vaccine. You have to give it as the triple, and I don't feel that's something she needs. And he said, oh no, I can just give her the single vaccine for the rubella, which he did. And that was what caused it. And that was my concern was that she had one vaccine. If she'd had three vaccines all in one, how would that have affected her immune system? You know, so it was a, it was a real eye opener to, to what, what's out there that we don't know about. We just accept blindly. And um, yeah, so basically I get fast forward again to, to the new year of 2023, New Year's Eve, 2022, 2023, I was feeling unwell. And I was on this course and I was seeing this kinesiologist who was amazing. She did acupuncture and Chinese medicine and, and, and as well as kinesiology. And I went to see her for, for a treatment. And I just said to her, Do you know, I never feel well. I feel like I eat a really healthy diet. I, I, I'm veg. Well, at that point, we had reintroduced a bit of meat, but I was mainly still eating a lot of vegetables. I've always loved vegetables, loved salad. My kids tease me that if I ever went in the I'm a celebrity jungle, my meal of choice when I came out would be a salad. They've always, you know, it. I just love salads and vegetables. And um, yeah, so I just said, I just never feel well. And um, I feel like I'm not absorbing any of the nutrients out of my food. That's how I, how I felt. And she helped me. I went to her blood test. The blood test came back that I was pre-diabetic. So I was really shocked, really shocked. I have no diabetes in my family. Um, I wasn't really, I mean, yeah, I was carrying probably an extra stone, but nothing horrendous, you know, like, like we all do when we get older. <laughs> it's like, I really should lose a bit of weight. Um, and I, I was shocked. And I, being of the mind now, as I have been for many years, of what can I do to sort this out, I started to research it because I'm not having this, I'm not going to be diabetic. And then I knew that carbs were an issue. I've always been very aware of how much food affects your body, which is why I've always been so disappointed that I thought I was eating a really healthy diet and I never felt well. I was always having to supplement with, um, you know, vitamins and always taking extra stuff, always a bit in the dark, not quite knowing whether I was doing the right thing. And I kind of, I, I stopped eating carbs or cut out carbs and I lost about five pounds, which really surprised me because quite quickly I lost five pounds. But we went on holiday, relaxed, and I put the five pounds straight back on again. So I thought there's got to be some other way I can do this. And that's when I started to explore on YouTube and look for, you know, the doctor YouTube because <laughs> I feel a lot more confident in that than I do in my own doctor um and i came across dr boz who is a keto doctor and I, I listened to her story about how she helped her mother who'd had cancer and it was a really heart moving story and she gave the three examples of the keto diet being the one that the john hopkins hospital are using and if the queen was on speed dial she knows she would be referred to the, the john hopkins hospital and they were putting keto in practice for people with chemo, having chemo. And she talked about the Navy SEALs using keto so they could go underwater for longer and not get seizures. And also the one that really fascinated me because my other, one of my daughters suffers from seizures and she controls it through her diet. Um, and she's never been on medication, but she's had some major seizures since she was about 15. But she had already looked into the keto diet. So I, I was kind of aware of that. But the one that amazed me was she's, she, Dr. Boz was saying that they're, they're experimenting and uh, they're um, doing autopsies on the brains of those children back from the 40s and 50s. And they're finding that their brains are in such amazing condition. She was saying, you know, I've got brain envy. They just they're just there's no sign of dementia or anything in the brains of these children that have lived the keto diet all their life to keep their seizures at bay. So that was quite an eye opener. So I followed that for a while and then started to lose weight. And then I came across um, Dr. Mindy Peltz and I thought that was an amazing, her story was really good. And I thought that would really help my one of my girls who suffered with hormone issues. 
then I discovered one of my other daughters was already doing the Dr. Mindy Peltz thing. And we, we discovered we were both following the same person, which was quite funny. And it was kind of from there, really. It, it progressed into then discovering Dr. Ken Berry and um, Sean Baker and you and lots of other people and just finding it fascinating that it could make that much difference. But the biggest thing for us, for my husband and I, was his knee pain. It just disappeared. <laughs> you know, it, it was quite incredible. Started New Year's Eve or you kind of, that's when you were starting to look? Yeah, no, New Year's Eve was when I was feeling unwell. And it was a few months before I, I, pr I probably went to the doctor's probably in February, I, I was feeling dizzy all the time. I had a, it turned out I had a neck issue. I had a, a trapped, my osteopath sorted it out in the end fully, but through the kinesiology as well, the actual dizziness was was um, to do with this pinched nerve in my neck. But um, the heart palpitations and things, I think were to do with eating and not eat. I, yeah, so the years, so I didn't actually start probably may but i had oh. to introduce meat okay that's where that's where the mistake yeah. i've made was because i assumed new year's eve last year so new year's eve 2022 so new year's eve 2022 so if i go back a, oh, okay. a little bit here sorry to jump about but the, the year before 2022 actually it goes back further than that for let's let's start from the beginning so i'd always grown up eating meat because my dad was a butcher, yeah? So as a kid, we ate good food, we ate meat and veg, home-cooked food. My mum cooked the basic, traditional British meat and two veg. My dad loved to experiment, so he would make bolognese and chilies and curries and all those things back in the 70s that other people weren't eating. I was, As a kid, I was envious of my friends because they always got to go home to fish fingers and chips and I went home to steak. I used to think, why can't I eat that food? <laughs> you, you know, you don't appreciate these things when you're a child. And so we had a good grounding in good food all through into my teens. And into my dad was a butcher probably into when I'm into my 20s. Um, so I always had access to good meat. But I was always squeamish as a child about the idea of eating meat. As a child, I didn't like it when I opened the fridge and there'd be a cow tongue in there or a turkey with its head on you know um I found that association thing quite difficult to deal with and so then when I got into my 20s and I was living in a house um with lambs at the bottom of the garden I stopped eating lamb because I was upset I couldn't the idea of eating lamb upset me and then I went vegetarian a few times on and off I was vegetarian when I was pregnant with my third child this is an interesting thing I craved steak when I was pregnant with her. I absolutely craved steak and I had to start eating meat again when I was pregnant. So there's your body saying this is what you need. Weirdly, she's the only one of mine that's been vegetarian since she was 11 and still is. <laughs> but she was the one I craved meat when I was even, no, pregnant. Um, so then, so yeah, so fast forward, we get into about 10 years ago. And I'd sort of always preferred vegetarian food. I'd always cook vegetarian food. My husband would say that was lovely if only it had some meat in it, you know, those sort of things. But but we we enjoyed vegetarian food as well as food with meat. My youngest daughter always loved meat. She didn't care about the association. Her older siblings used to say, you do know that's a pig you're eating. And she'd go, mm, yum, yum. You know, she, she didn't care. <laughs> Um, so we we got through to about 10 years ago and my husband wanted to watch the video Car uh, Cowspiracy. And I kept saying, if we watch that, I won't eat meat again. I know I won't. I can't watch it because that will be it. And I'd already had a bout of being severely anemic. I mean, my, my um, from my late 40s into my, you know, all through my 50s, I was severely suffering from problems like anemia and it it became exasperated when I'd gone vegetarian for a while and then I'd done juicing and I'd done this I'd followed this guy I can't even remember his name and I'd done these this juicing thinking it was really healthy and I'd felt so great I'd done it for another week and at the end of the week 
I went out to meet a friend. I felt really peculiar. I felt like I was walking through water. Like I was, you know how you'd feel like your legs just don't want to move. Really difficult. And I felt really, I got home and I said to my husband, I feel really ill. I literally had no energy, no strength. And I went to the doctors and they told me that my ferritin levels were so low, I was severely anemic and I needed to sort it out. So then I started eating liver and steak and, you know, all the vegetables that are supposed to be full, you know, spinach and all, all this thinking I was doing all the right things. I, I was, I'd lost loads of weight very suddenly and I was really, really unwell for a period of time. So so a couple of years on when my husband wanted to watch the Cowspiracy movie, I was like, I don't I don't want to go there because I'll be squeamish and I'll, I won't want to eat meat again. I struggle already, but because of my iron levels, I really need to, you know, keep eating meat. But I felt like I was eating meat to keep my iron levels up, not because I wanted to eat meat. And and um, I'd had little reoccurrences of the low iron le uh, ferritin levels where I didn't feel great. So I was always sort of borderline. But that that literally was exasperated by juicing and and not eating meat for a while. Literally, it nearly killed me. Um, so we watched Cowspiracy. And as expected, I was like, right, that's it. I'm not eating meat anymore. And my husband was like, well, I suppose if it would help the planet, we should maybe try being vegetarian because we totally bought into it. So having said all that, we were then vegetarian and vegan for a little while, but that was virtually impossible back then to, to to be vegan it was really hard we went to Australia to visit our son and it was oh so hard there because they they're not into they or they weren't back then really into that sort of thing at all and um yeah we just we just did that we were we were vegan vegetarian and then probably after about five years we introduced a bit of meat a bit of fish sorry but but occasionally and we thought we were doing the right thing for the planet, you know? And then 2020 struck. Um, we opened our eyes to all sorts of things that were going on in the world. And we thought, this is weird. This is weird. I think that happened with a lot of people. <laughs> it was this realization that you take everything they tell you and you flip it on its head. And that was the thing for me, I thought, ah, this vegan movement has really taken off. Is there some sort of agenda going on here? <laughs> I'm really suspicious now. So I started to think for a while before I actually did it that I would, I wanted to start eating meat. So I think it was the Christmas of 2021, just before that, I thought, I'm going to eat meat. I'm going to eat meat. And then I didn't. And then we got into 2022. Um, and my husband, well, actually, my mum had a stroke, weirdly, after three medical interventions. She was in really good health at 90. She had a stroke. She's in such good health. She fully recovered, even at 90, from that stroke. Amazing. My sister was diagnosed with pretty turbo cancer. Um, and various other things that were going on around us made me start to think, mm, you know, things are not right. And then my husband in 2022 needed to have a knee replacement because he'd been in agony for many, many years with pain in his knee, arthritis in his knee. So in May of 2022, he also had this knee replacement. And he didn't recover well. He didn't do well with the surgery. He's, he really didn't recover well. And we we struggled through and we got to um june and then he got an infection in that leg not in the actual wound but in the same leg he got he got a funny looked like an insect bite or something um and then it spread and then it turned into this thing called cellulitis which is pretty serious and his leg was all infected and we were back and forth to the hospital and he was being put on intravenous antibiotics and he was having an allergic reaction to the antibiotics. So he was swelling up everywhere. And we did that for about a week. And then on about day six or seven of this treatment where he was back and forth to the hospital having intravenous antibiotics, they suddenly went, 
oh, we don't think it's the cellulitis that's spreading. We think you're allergic to the, pen, the um, antibiotics we're putting in you. So let's give you some antihistamine, which they then pumped into him and then said, now we'll carry on with the antibiotics. So he reacted again. And this was like this. Somebody said to me at that point, if all if all a workman has is one tool and it's a hammer, he'll see everything as a nail. And that was exactly what was happening with the hospital. They just couldn't think of anything else to do other than keep putting antibiotics in. And then antihistamine to counteract the, the reaction. And he ended up almost looking like the elephant man. I mean, it was just so bad. And I just one morning we both got up and he was due to go back to the hospital. And I said to him, you can't do this anymore. We can't do this anymore. We have to stop. We have to sort this out ourselves. This is this is ridiculous. So he went to the hospital and they wheeled out the antibiotics and he said, I'm not doing that. I want to speak to the doctor. And a young, he's seen a, a different doctor every day that he'd been in there. And this doctor came out and, she, and I said to him, be prepared to do battle. They won't like it. And she came out and he said to her, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to go home and my wife and I are going to try and sort this out ourselves. And she went, I think you're doing the right thing. Shock horror. So he came home. I had been out that day. I'd sat there thinking, I need to go and get my husband some meat. I need to go and do this. We need to eat meat. I don't know why I thought that. I, it had been niggling there, you know, for so long. And uh, we are very lucky here where we live. We are surrounded by amazing organic farms, biodynamic farms. You know, we are so lucky here. I'd always shop there for all their veggies. Amazing. But now it was like, I'm going there to get your meat, to get your meat. And I started buying organic chicken carcasses and making bone broth. And slowly he got well. And slowly um, that was our diet shifting, but it was a slow process. We didn't go fully into it at that point. We just started to reintroduce some meat. And that October of that year, our daughter and her boyfriend, our youngest daughter and her boyfriend, who also was also vegetarian at this point and had been for a long time, even though she loved me as a kid. She came home to live with us because they had to move out of their rental accommodation. And she said, could we come back for a few weeks? They ended up being here for 15 months, but <laughs> they've gone now. Um, she moved back in and I said, just warning you, we are now eating meat. So if you're moving back in, how do you feel about that? And she went, I don't know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll see. The first time she came home, she was here and I cooked a roast chicken. She phoned me up the next day. She said, can I eat the rest of the chicken in the fridge? So she was back. <laughs> One roast chicken and she was done. <laughs> yeah. So she's back to eating meat now as well. In fact, she's following the keto diet, you know, doing really well on it. Really well. So just to clarify um, the timeline, but you said October there. You're talking October 2023, 2022? No. 2022, 2022. Okay. So we'd started eating meat. Sorry, I'm moving my camera. Um, we started eating meat in around, just slightly before that, probably about August, September. But it wasn't, it, it, you know, we were still eating a lot of vegetables. I just started a veggie garden here. I'd grown loads of vegetables that year. And last year I grew loads of vegetables and we were eating masses of vegetables. Um too much and they were making me feel unwell that that was really interesting and that's it was only recently the towards the end of last year that I started to learn about oxalates and I went oh, that's what was wrong we were eating masses of spinach masses of chard masses you know beetroot beet leaves because I'd, I'd grown all this and, and we thought we were doing really well we were eating that with a little bit of meat but we were eating way way too many vegetables and I was feeling poisoned, but I couldn't understand why. I had no idea why I was feeling poisoned. So last, so yeah, so that was October 2022. Then that New Year's Eve 2022, 23 was when I started feeling unwell and I was doing the kinesiology course. My kinesiology tutor, who I said I went to see for treatment, she said to me, you should eat meat. You should eat meat. She kept saying, you should eat meat. Don't believe in vegetarianism, you know. So she was she was encouraging the pre, the sort of way we were starting to move, and um, but as I say, last year we ate loads of veggies, even though we'd introduced meat. So it was you know it, 
I still wasn't feeling the benefits of it, even though I'd cut down on carbs, like the pasta and the rice and potatoes and things um, towards the middle of last year. We'd cut those things out, still eating a lot of vegetables. And um, it's quite hard when you've nurtured and grown all these lovely vegetables to just go, meh, you know, not going to eat those anymore. Um, But it was a friend who started, she's she's a, a, a cancer survivor and she is very careful about what she eats and very, you know, very aware of stuff. And she mentioned oxalates to me and she said she was cutting out oxalates. She sees, she was giving me her veggies that she grew in her garden because she said, I can't eat these anymore. <laughs> and I realised she was poisoning me instead. <laughs> but uh, so that opened, I thought, oh, I can't deal with anything else. I can't deal with oxalates as well. I, I, I'm not even going to look at that. I'm just going to carry on with this bit over here. So it was only really, so last year, my husband had been told by the consultant that his knee pain, sadly, he was probably one of 10% that had the knee replacement and it didn't really work. And he was just going to have to deal with the pain. And his other knee would need replacing at some some point. And he was absolutely determined he didn't want to have another knee replacement because he suffered so badly with everything that had happened. And so... Um, he started the con he started the low carbohydrate with me the keto i'd been doing it for about a month and he'd seen that i'd lost weight and he needed to lose a bit of weight too so he said you know oh yeah okay I'll, i might as well give it a go as well so he did and uh, it was a couple of months into it that he went he said my knees don't hurt anymore <laughs> and i noticed he was walking without limping you know, because we've got a dog and we walk and he couldn't walk very far because his knees just hurt all the time. So I would do the long walks with the dogs, with friends, and he would do shorter walks because his knees hurt. And he just realised one day that his knees didn't hurt anymore. And it was like, wow, well, that's got, you know, I was like, that's got to be cutting out carbs because it's the only, it's the only thing you've done that's different. And, uh, I started to feel better. I started to feel healthier. My digestion, because I've always had issues with my digestion all my adult life, literally really bad digestive issues, which obviously now I realise is all the vegetables I kept eating <laughs> and the bread and, yeah. So Wow. Yeah, amazing. So, so, so what, um, what is your, you're in your husband's diet right now? Like how are you eating throughout the day? Well, an example yesterday, it was Mothering Sunday here yesterday, so we were going out for dinner with the kids. But in the morning, I said, I don't want to be hungry when we go, because if you go out for dinner, this is the problem we have. When you go out for a meal, if you order a steak, you just get a small steak and you can't really eat anything else. And so that doesn't really fill you up enough. So in the morning, I made us a, I made us a whacking great big um, mince burgers, like, beef burgers and bacon and eggs and we ate that in the morning because we knew we weren't eating until quite late in the afternoon and so then when we went out last, yesterday i think we ate about four four thirty i had um well we both had uh beef bourguignon which did have wine and stuff and it had some mashed potato and i'm not a big mash i'm not a big potato fan so i ate a little bit of it um and that was kind of it and i tend to drink sparkling water my husband's a little bit more relaxed than me. He's he's lost a couple of stone. His knees don't hurt anymore, so he's a bit more relaxed when we go out. And he'll he'll have a glass of red wine or and and maybe a dessert or whatever. But I try to avoid it. I I do still struggle with the sweet tooth. Um, but yeah, I, at the moment I'm doing a, a I'm fasting now from yesterday. I do a we do a lot of um well not a lot we we fast most days. We probably do eat sometime in the afternoon around three between three and six we'll probably have our main meal sometimes we'll have one meal if it's a big meat meal because it's very filling sometimes we might have two we might have a little maybe some bone broth or something and then uh, meat later in the afternoon and um, we try and have a narrow eating window um usually no more than about six hours and then don't eat again from maybe whatever time we've eaten in the afternoon, evening, early evening until about lunchtime or further on. So we will do 
at least an 18 hour fast, I would say most days, sometimes 20, sometimes 24. And once a month, roughly, although we were doing it more, we would have, we would do a 48 hour fast. And I'm actually doing that now from yesterday because I had a good meat basis yesterday, grounding protein and lots of fat yesterday. It, it helps you go into a longer fast if you if you've been satiated with lots of fat and that's been a huge thing to get my head around is eating lots of fat because it's so against my era of growing up in the 70s and 80s of low fat foods you know yeah it's, it's ca interesting. counterintuitive right yeah so it's weird when i'm pouring all my meat fat into a jar and keeping it and then digging it all out to cook my food again. <laughs> so, yeah, like we were brought up to believe that was radioactive sludge we were not to touch, right? Yeah. I mean, now it's the, the prized possession. Yeah. Well, in fact, you say that, but I, I actually grew up eating beef dripping on toast. We were, my mum and dad, we kept all our meat fats back then in the 60s and 70s and we would eat that on toast because it was delicious with all the jelly and everything at the bottom it, it was so delicious on toast um but it is very counterintuitive having said that i've always had i've always been wary about um things like aspartame and all those things from the 80s i didn't give them to my kids my kids i didn't let them have low fat and i'd ra you know i would rather they had stuff with actual sugar in than fake sugar because and that's quite that's become almost impossible now whereas when they were little you could at least they didn't ever drink fizzy drinks as a but it was a treat occasionally which sounds ridiculous now that it's a treat but you know it was for kids to have a fizzy drink i would look for fizzy drinks that just had sugar and no aspartame now i think it has sugar and aspartame in you can't you can't get away from it i think for kids it's it's tough you know mm. yeah i mean they they literally they they can't run unless they've got a diet that's like carnivore or a keto or something they they can't get away from it at all no it's impossible and it's so sad it's it, it, you know you you look i worked in a supermarket for a while about five or six years ago i worked in a supermarket for a while you know stacking shelves and things and uh i used to be astonished literally astonished at the number of products new products coming in every day there were not room on the shelves for the different varieties of one particular type of food that they could create in some different way with more and more different things in it you'd be like this is ridiculous how many varieties of flavored teas do you need or you know it was, it was just cra it's crazy the, the food industry it's, it's quite shocking yeah but and you know the the scary thing is you know all these breakfast cereals and whatever none of the food scientists at these companies are there to you know think about the nutritional content of the food they're there to think about the addictive qualities of the food absolutely that's the thing i've learned this bliss point that they go for this this mixture of salt sugar and fat that gives you this bliss point and you can see that when someone eats a chocolate bar or whatever it's just got that it, it it draws you in i mean i've had issues with food you know I, when i went through a horrendous divorce back in my early 30s I, food became such an emotional crutch and i would eat and then make myself sick and it frightened me that how difficult how easy that was to happen and how difficult it was to pull myself out of it as well it and and i was in my 30s at that point you know and, and wine would be the go-to you know if i was feeling sad or feeling angry i would open a bottle of wine and you know it, it, it's just this thing that people do and i think that's the other real eye-opener is when you get those things out of your diet you feel mentally and emotionally so much better anyway you don't realize kind of, you're pounding it yeah you, you feel so much more you know the only way i can really describe it is it's emotionally it sounds a bit weird but i feel like it's emotionally flat there's yeah, no kind of crazy is. ups and crazy downs you know it is yeah. it is quite sad really that you and you can see it in other people as well and and you want to 
you want to say that I don't I don't sadly push or f- talk too much about what I'm doing because people are weird about it people people it I was talking to my daughter about it yesterday and she said it's a their problem not a you problem <laughs> because because they do they they kind of almost are a little bit afraid if someone if you say like, you know we've, we've had it with people we know people with diabetes and stuff and you say to them you can do something about that you could actually change your diagnosis with your diet and, they, and they're like no no mm. so there there's so many there uh, there's so many competing things as well for people that are suffering diabetes like there's the addiction factor that's kind of keeping them like i can't give up my bread or i can't give up my cereal or whatever it is but then there's also there's doctors out there on tv or doctors they're seeing that's telling them well you know diabetes is just something that you have to manage once you've once you've developed it you just have to live with it buddy you know yeah and so it's a, a combination of addiction and giving up hope really yeah but when so, when when you say to somebody oh i don't eat breakfast anymore i couldn't not eat my breakfast literally people are like i couldn't i couldn't not have breakfast i'd feel weak i'd feel you know there's all sorts of reasons why they feel they couldn't have breakfast and and if you say you're doing anything longer than a you know not just having not breakfast but not eating for two days they're like how how can you do that that's crazy you know why would you do that that would make me ill and I think actually it would be quite the opposite, really. It would actually make you well. Yeah, it'd probably have a good impact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if if you were talking to a friend that was open to this and they said, "Look, I, I want to give this a try, but I'm not sure how to get started," um, what advice would you give them? Well, I'd I'd definitely say start slowly. I think jumping straight in. I kind of I'm quite happy for the way it happened for us it was a very gradual thing because I think you know knowing now about oxalates and things if you start cutting out certain foods you can you can have oxalate dumping and not that I've don't I don't feel like I've experienced any of that particularly that I'm aware of but I just I just think we'll start slowly and, and research you know f- look for information find find people's success stories you know, find things like your website where people talk about their own personal experiences because that's what that's what will help you to sort of see i think you know relate to people that you can relate to and and yeah just give it a go i don't I, i've always believed well most all of my adult life i've believed that food is important what we put in our body i thought i was doing the right thing i think this, the, the reason i struggle a bit with talking to people about this is because I was vegetarian and vegan before it sort of became fashionable and a lot of people thought we were mad, you know, why are you you doing that, you know, we thought we were doing the right thing at the time, we realise now. One of the things I've learned over the last four years, since 2020, is be, be open to anything being true or not true, you know, just, just be open to different ideas and thoughts and views because i think people are realizing it more and more people are waking up if if it's not what happened in 2020 specifically that wakes people up it's the things that have been happening since that are starting to make people go that's not right (laughs) that doesn't sound right because there's so many crazy things going on in the world at the moment the world has gone completely mad and you do just have to look at it and go flip it on its head if they're saying that then it's probably the complete opposite and so if they're pushing you shouldn't eat meat because meat's bad for the environment it's probably the complete opposite of that and i do now believe that is exactly what it is the complete opposite because i i think dr ken berry's got it right with this proper human diet and i think that's one of the things when i do talk to people about it i say well what can be wrong with taking processed foods out of your diet and eating natural foods that we've been eating for thousands of years how can that be a bad thing you know and and those foods that you buy in the supermarket that are all processed and made with so many ingredients you don't know you don't you just don't even know you don't recognize the names 
in there. How can that be good for our bodies? It's, it's such it's so simple and so obvious when you when you think about it like that. That's a very good way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, so, Karen, do you have any social media if people want to reach out to you? No, I came off all social media in 2020 and 2021, unfortunately, because because I wasn't thinking or feeling the same way as everybody else seemed to be thinking and feeling. I found it really hard to to be involved. Um, and I just pulled myself away. To be honest, from 2020 was a tough time because it actually did cause lots of issues with friends and family because we did my husband and I didn't believe what was happening and then in 2021 um someone I knew who'd also was thinking this feeling the same way she was my dental hygienist weirdly she was feeling the same way as me and I said to her I don't know what to do I feel so lonely because it doesn't feel like there's anybody else out there and she so go and find a stand in the park She's and I was like, oh, okay. So we went to stand. We went to we found a stand in the park, and that turned our lives around because basically we went to stand in the park. We made friends with all the people there. It was an amazing group of people, and from there we got introduced to a group called the Indigo Group, who are a group of people that meet twice a month to chat about all sorts of weird things, from aliens to spiritual, you know, to food or. And that's been, I mean, tomorrow morning, for example, I'm going to a talk on the Bosnian pyramids. It, you know, they, there's just these amazing, and that's part of this group. And it's it's just this amazing people. We've made new friends and I don't need social media anymore. I, I did need it for a long time, but I let it go. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I just couldn't do it. No worries. Well, Karen, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Dave. It's good. And I enjoy your videos. I really do.